I'm a fan of riding older motorcycles. There's a unique charm and character that you just don't get from riding a modern machine. It's not to say that they're better because on paper, clearly they're not. They're just different, enjoyable, and at times thrilling if you get a gear shift wrong or overestimate how good the brakes are. Before we get going, remember, if you like this video, then give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button. Also, head over to Facebook and join our Biker Talk community group to connect with others who are probably just as motorcycle obsessed as you are. And if you're after any new motorcycle gear, then check out our online store. We've just listed a whole range of new apparel from premium brands like Bellstuff, Pando Moto, and Rocker. The Kawasaki Z1 is a bike that I have long admired. I remember seeing one as a kid and being blown away by both the looks and the sound. To me, it's what a motorbike should look like, and I knew if I ever got the chance to ride one, I'd be straight onto it. I've ridden and reviewed Kawasaki's modern offering, the Z900 RS. It's a fantastic motorcycle that very much pays homage to Kawasaki's from the 1970s but I've always wanted to have a go on the original or as closest to the original as I could get my hands on. In this case, one of my very good mates, 1976 KZ900. It's like a Z1, only better. I'll have to do a story with Tim at some point on the channel because he has a beautiful collection of bikes, including a Z900 RS and an awesome GPZ900. The Kawasaki Z1 was made from 1973 to 1977 and was one of the flagship models in Kawasaki's lineup during the 70s. These days, it's considered by many to be one of the most iconic motorcycles of that era and for very good reason. The 1970s was a decade of intense competition between Honda and Kawasaki. Both companies were at the forefront of innovation and technology and both wanted to release a large capacity inline four cylinder. Honda dominated the early part of the decade, releasing the revolutionary Honda CB750 in 1969. It was the first production motorcycle to feature a single overhead camshaft with a four-cylinder engine and disc brakes. It was a groundbreaking motorcycle that set the standard for performance and technology at the time. So Kawasaki went back to the drawing board, not wanting to release their own 750cc inline four. Japanese pride dictated that their offering had to be bigger and better. And in late 1972, Kawasaki announced the mighty Z1, a 900cc inline four cylinder that was codenamed during development as the New York State Project. It signaled Kawasaki's entry into the superbike era and featured a double overhead camshaft, which was very unusual for the time. The Z1 was released to the public in 1973, and in 1976, there were some slight tweaks to the bike, such as the carburetors, which went from 28mm Makunis to 26, a lockable fuel cap, and a squared off taillight. It was renamed the KZ900 for that year until it was replaced in 1977 by the KZ1000. So, let's take a look at the technical specs of the 1976 KZ900. Out of the factory, it had a 903cc inline four-cylinder engine that put out a claimed 82 brake horsepower at 8,500 RPM. Now that's still pretty good by modern standards, but it made it an absolute brute of a bike in the 1970s. The engine was fed by four 26mm Makuni carbs, which gave it better low and mid-range power. On the front, there's a conventional telescopic fork setup with a 19 inch spoked rim and a single 11 and a half inch disc. A single disc was specific to the model released in the US. European and Australian delivered bikes had a twin disc setup. On the rear, there's a dual sided swing arm with twin shocks and an 18 inch spoked rim with a drum brake, which was pretty standard for the time. It weighs 232 kilograms dry has a fuel tank which is just under 18 litres and came in two colours for the 1976 year model, diamond dark green and diamond brown. The Z1 and later the KZ900 were awarded MCM Machine of the Year from 1973 to 1976, therefore affirming this bike as the iconic bike of the 1970s and it is just as desirable to own and ride some 50 years later. There is so much to like about bikes like the Kawasaki KZ900, but like riding any classic bike, there are a few things you need to consider. Firstly, take time to get familiar with the bike and learn about its specific nuances. 
be mindful of maintenance. Classic bikes may require more maintenance than modern bikes. So stay on top of regular tasks like oil changes and tune-ups and check things like tyres and brakes before each ride to ensure they're in good working order. Take it easy, well, at least at first. You need to get used to the handling, the acceleration and the brakes, or in some cases, the lack of brakes. And above all else, enjoy the ride. Riding a classic motorcycle can be a unique experience, so take the time to enjoy the ride and appreciate the history and charm of the bike you're riding. So what are the unique things about the KZ900? Firstly, that drum brake on the rear is ordinary, no big surprise there. I noticed a slight fuel leak when I parked up, so I had to be mindful to turn the fuel tap off. This was probably due to a float being stuck in one of the carbies. But let's be honest, it wouldn't be a classic bike without a leak of some description. And as my dad used to say, old bikes don't leak, they just mark their territory. On the upside, there's heaps to like about the bike. Number one, there was a very pleasing and satisfying thunk as you put it into first gear. It let you know that the bike was ready to rock and roll. It wasn't a slick snick like so many modern bikes. There was this old school mechanical charm at play that evoked a real sense of nostalgia. Secondly, it's a head turner. There were no shortage of people wanting to chat about the bike when either stopped at a set of traffic lights or when I parked it up. Old bikes like this are conversation starters and surely that's a good thing. Design wise, it's stunning. It looks like a proper motorcycle. The four headers running into the four exhaust pipes are a work of art. It's probably my favourite design element on this bike, although the classic tank and the iconic Kawasaki ducktail are brilliant. The ducktail has become a hallmark of Kawasaki's design language that continues today on bikes like the Z900 RS. And finally, you have to ride it. There's no electronic wizardry or rider aids to rely on. You hit the start button or use the kickstart if you want to show off, and theoretically, twist the throttle and off you go. You can feel the mechanics at work. You can hear the pistons and smell the oil and the fuel. Although that fuel smell could have been because of the leaky Makuni. There are plenty of reasons you'd look at owning one of these classic machines, but above all else, it's just a pleasure to ride. The KZ900 was known for its smooth ride and its excellent handling when it was released, and that still rings true today. Now because of the YouTube channel, I'm lucky enough to ride a lot of different bikes. Most of them I get for a few weeks to review. For me, any day on a motorbike is a good day and it would be very unusual if I found a bike that I had nothing good to say about. On the other hand, there are very few bikes that I just click with straight away, but the KZ900 is definitely one of those bikes. It just suited me. It suited my style of riding and I felt from the very first kick completely in sync with this bike. If I wanted to kick back and cruise, it would putt along without any complaint. On the other hand, if I wanted to wrap on the power, I could feel the four Makunis working and the four pistons pumping to the point where the bike would be screaming along, but without any complaints. I covered a variety of roads on the KZ900. Country roads, a beautiful ride through the Royal National Park, and I even commuted into the office on it across the Sydney Harbour Bridge to a little spot called Lavender Bay to get some photos. It was a great bike to hit some twisty roads on. The suspension for what is nearly a 50 year old bike is very good and it soaked up the bumps with ease. When it was released, it was one of the fastest motorcycles around with a top speed of 120 miles per hour or about 193 kilometers per hour. Now I obviously didn't get it up to those kind of speeds, but it will very quickly get to the legal speed limit and stay there with plenty in reserve. This is a bike that you could rack up some big kilometres on. In fact, my mate Tim is thinking about taking it around Tasmania next year, and if he does that, I'll join him on my 1972 Laverda. 
It's comfortable, it has plenty of power and looks the goods. It was a great bike to ride, although if I owned one, I probably wouldn't use it as a commuter. Firstly, because the clutch is quite heavy in traffic and you're really working those muscles, but mostly because of how special it is. It's the kind of bike you'd take out for coffee with mates on the weekend or head off for a weekend away. The only downside is trying to find one at an affordable price. They have very quickly become a bike that gets snapped up on the rare occasion you see one for sale. The charm of the KZ900 is in its simplicity and its elegance. It evokes a sense of yearning for a time when craftsmanship and attention to detail were highly valued. Above all else, the Kawasaki KZ900 is one New York steak that is not overcooked. That's all for today. We'll be back next week with another rider story. We also have reviews coming up of the highly anticipated Royal Enfield Super Meteor and the epic BMW S1000 RR. If there's a new bike or a classic bike that you'd like to see us review, then let us know in the comments below. Till next time, enjoy the ride.